Uh, our speaker this evening is Dr. Michael Nolan. Um, I've known Mike since both he and I were quite a bit younger than we are now. Um, our, our hair wasn't quite this, this gray. But uh, Mike got his bachelor's from Caltech and then a PhD from U of A, Lunar Planetary Lab. He went from U of A to Arecibo in Puerto Rico, where he did a variety of things. He'll tell you about some of them, um, including pinging various asteroids like Bennu with radar. Then he came back here a few years ago and is now a senior research associate here and senior research scientist, sorry, um, here and is also the science team chief, I love that title, for the OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission. So without further ado, Mike Nolan. Thank you, Tim. All right, yes, as Tim said, I was here once before in this classroom was brand spanking new. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about Bennu. Uh, I have just a few different topics I've put up here that uh, the, the mission is in, is in full, full blast. And just show you some cool stuff. Feel free to ask questions. I don't really have a, a conclusion. It's just we're, we're having a really good time right now. Yep. Turn. At Arecibo, you can't use these, so I never learned to drive one. Hmm. It caused interference. All right, so um, Osiris Rex is the mission, as a mission to asteroid Bennu, and it is primarily it's an it's a sample return mission. It's going to bring back pieces of the, the asteroid, and so it has a whole lot of scientific instrumentation. But unlike most spacecraft you've probably heard about, the, the scientific the, the instrumentation is sort of secondary to bringing back this sample. And so the science team is very concentrated on doing what they need to do to make sure we can bring back the best sample. Uh, so the requirements that we're supposed to bring back at least 60 grams of pristine sample from Bennu. In fact, the mechanism can bring back up to a, a couple of kilograms, almost five pounds in principle. Documentation where it, came, uh, where it came from and also basically just, it's got little Velcro thingies that will just sort of pick up dust from the surface. This is, um, this is the actual one, this is one of the testing, this is the, the head that we use to pick up the, the, the sample. Basically, it, it blows nitrogen through a filter and picks up a bunch of stuff. And, oh, there was, and here, of course, is, the, is one of the tests we did to pick up material. You will notice that this is basically sand, um, and that's going to get to be an issue in a moment. All right, but we're not there yet. That's going to happen next year. Right now, we're studying the asteroid. So this is a, a, a diagram of the telescope. Right? Uh, we have solar panels. This is the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. It's about yay high. Um, uh, it this, is the, this is the antenna to talk to the Earth with. This is the sample return capsule. Eventually, that's where the sample's going to end up. And the, you can see it sort of has this heat shield shape. It's going to get dropped into the, into the atmosphere. It's going to re-enter like all those re-entering spacecraft crash into the desert in Utah, and we're going to go pick it up. Uh, we have a bunch of different instruments, uh, several cameras, a laser ranger, a couple of spectrometers, um, all designed to go and study this asteroid, find out all about it so we can tell what we're going to get back and, and pick the best place to go. So before we did this, we had to study as much as we could about Bennu which just isn't that much for an asteroid. Uh, we know what its orbit is, so here's, uh, here's the orbits of the planets, and here's the asteroid Bennu. You can see it comes close to the Earth. That helps a lot as far as building your spacecraft to get there. If you don't have to go very far, it's just a lot easier to do. Getting rockets out into space is very expensive, and the less you have, the, if you don't have to go too far, it's not quite as expensive. Uh, we did have uh, a, a sort of crude shape model. It's basically a roundish, blumpy thing. Yeah, we knew that. A uh, little under 500 meters across. We knew that it's sort of what we call this spinning top shape. Uh, we know how fast it rotates. It rotates in 4.3 hours. That was done by another person who's uh, fr uh, from LPL at that in, in the late 90s. We know about how dense it is. It's, uh, it's hard. I was looking to see what to, what to compare that to, and it turns out glycerin also has a density of 1,300. Uh, there's nothing. Um, it's a little denser than water. Uh, and that co is a combination of the rocks that it's made out of are fairly, fairly low density, and it's got a lot of just empty space in it. 
It's about 5% albedo, and albedo is a measure of how, 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 reflected, how much light does it reflect. And 5%, 4%, 5%, it's about as reflective as charcoal. And in fact, at one point, I went and 3D printed a model of it, and it's really hard to see because it's just dark. Um, it, uh, we measured uh, this, as best we could the chemistry from the Earth, and the carbonaceous chondrite is one of the most primitive kinds of meteorites that we know about. And so we're going to bring bringing back a piece of the early solar system, which was a lot of the point of the mission, which was the entire point of the mission. All right, here we are. Here's actual pictures of Bennu. These are actually from late last year in, de in December, uh, as we were just arriving at Bennu. And uh, I have some more, much more recent pictures, but these are the pictures where you can actually see the whole thing. So. Sure, it, it, uh, we have the, it has the spinning top shape, but you will notice that it's not sandy. Um, and we're going to have to work some on that. So this is what, but this is, uh, so, this is, so we, we're going from what I showed before to this is, to this is Bennu. All right, so my experience with Bennu, as Tim said, I went to the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. This is the Arecibo Observatory, so I remember to talk about it. Uh, this is, in fact, I can tell by the, where the plants are growing that this is, in a fact, in a, from about 1999. In 1999, I was a junior scientist um, at Arecibo. I'd been there a couple of years. And when I applied for the job there, I said that one of the things I wanted to do was to take images of asteroids to study them so that we would know more in case we ever wanted to send a spacecraft to one. And so here we are doing that. So, uh, we, and so this, is, this is the largest radio telescope in the world. It's out in the jungles of Puerto Rico. Um, it, it's somewhat the worst from where, for wear from a hurricane. However, I, I think all the trees have grown back because in Puerto Rico they grew back pretty fast. So these are, it doesn't come out that great in this image. Th these are the actual radar data that we took. It doesn't look like all that much. It's kind of noisy and speckly, but you can see kind of how big it is. You can see that it's got some funny shapes. Using data like this, these data and about 10 times more, we made this shape model um, of, and you can see that it's a roundish thing. It's kind of lumpy. I didn't know it did that. <laughs> and you can see it's got this one kind of big rock on it. And then that's about what you can see. So uh, when we were headed off to Bennu, we said, OK, we know how big it is. We know it has this one big boulder. There's the boulder actually in the raw radar data. <coughs> And from um, looking at both the radar data and some other telescopic measurements, we said and we think the average particle size is about a centimeter on the ground. And again, that picture, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's what we knew. And we knew we had this one big boulder. And I thought that was about basically the size of this room, maybe as tall as this room. So when we arrived at Bennu, so this is again, I think this is actually November of last year. Uh, here's the model that we made. And here's the actual images we took as we're flying in. We were really happy that the model worked so well. Again, we were less happy about how many rocks there were. So what you can see is here's the little the boulder that we saw on the surface in those images. And here it is in real life. It's really there. It's about twice as big as we thought. I think to some extent, um, it turns out it's, 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 it's sort of glinting in the sun as it comes around here, not in the sun, in the radar. And that made a bright spot, but it's, it's, it's bigger than we thought. The, the, all the rocks on Bennu were somewhat bigger than we predicted. Hello. Time machine back up in progress. Thank you. There we go. So, but now that we're there, we're making better shape models, right? We're using the data we get to make a shape model. And so you can say, so. So again, here's the imagery that we, here's the imagery we were taking, and here's our, our updated shape model based on actually being there and taking pictures of it. So they're qualitatively similar, 
And clearly there's a lot more data, a lot more detail now that we're there. <coughs> All right, so here's, so this is the bend that we have to work with. As I said, uh, clearly it's, it's a lot rockier than we were at least imagining. Uh, one of the things, what we think has happened to some extent is we said, well, okay, it looks like the particles are about a centimeter. Well, I think what that means is that the, the rough, the, the bolt, there's lots of big boulders and the boulders are fairly smooth. So we can't tell smooth dirt from smooth boulders. And so what we're seeing is a whole lot of smooth boulders. And uh, that has led to us, now we we're going to figure out where it is we can go on this asteroid. One of the things we were worried about when we um, were headed, headed to Bennu was whether or not there might be a satellite orbiting Bennu that we would worry about crashing into. Right? If you hit, it, we wouldn't want to go all the way there and then like hit a satellite when we got there. So we did a, uh, this is a very detailed telescopic survey. It looks funny because it's, we've added up uh, a few hundred, I think, images uh, um, of, of the sky. And, basically, and, and we're looking for satellites that might be orbiting Bennu. We didn't see any, and that's, so that's good. There's nothing that we're going to crash into when we got there. However, about a month after we did that big search, we saw a whole bunch of little pebbles coming off. Um, and so uh, this picture is a, comp is a composite. We have a, a long exposure and a short exposure. So the long exposure we saw all, all of these, these particles, and then we have Bennu here in the short exposure. And so we saw a whole lot of little particles, and this is sort of showing you where they are compared to Bennu. And that was really neat. We were very worried for a while. Why didn't we see these before? Turns out these particles are sort of pea-sized. And they're really interesting. We're studying them. We want to know where they came from, but they're not big enough to hurt the spacecraft. So I mean, we, we were only really looking for things that might hurt the spacecraft, not, <coughs> not something that we might just see. So we're studying these as an interesting phenomenon. And actually, what we, we, we use them to learn about the, the, the internals of, of Bennu because of the gravity from Bennu is, is moving them around. And by studying where these particles are moving, we're able to measure the gravity of Bennu and measure its insides. So they're really cool, but they don't hurt anything. And this is, this is approximately what we got when we first discovered it. What we did here is take two images and subtract them. So the sky goes blank. And, but you'll see that there's, a, I don't know if you can see it at all. There's a, there's a white dot here and a black dot there. So the little particle has moved from here to there between these two images, which were taken probably two minutes apart. Another one has moved from here to there, from here to there. And from that, we can get the tracks of these particles and see what they're doing. And this is Bennu, which is a combination. It's been subtracted out. It also just blanked out because it would be so much brighter that we wouldn't be able to do anything. Right, so they're, they're much smaller than we're searching for because we, we were only searching for dangerous things. Pea size, the largest one is sort of a baseball sized thing. Uh, we have a couple hundred of them, and we're still finding them. We're still taking pictures of, and, and, and finding those. And then we have a pretty cool graphic. Here are the orbits that we've determined for all of these little particles going around. <coughs> and we were saying, oh, be, people had predictions about what these would look like. Some of them said, well, they'll be in the equatorial plane, they'll be polar, they're all over the place. So um, there's, the, you can see, and uh, some of them orbit and then leave. You'll see other ones. There's a couple that just kind of flash through. There, there's one that just, oh, that, that one just arrived and hit. Some of them just wander by. We think what's happening is these are things are being thrown off. And in fact, some of them are being thrown and then the solar wind the, and real, uh, the force from the sun is sort of blowing them back onto Bennu. So this is crazy. But anyway, we did not expect this. Um, and uh, we're, uh, one, we're, we're studying because it's a really cool phenomenon. It tells us about Bennu. And we're trying to figure out where these came from. That's one of the things we're trying to do now. Okay, Bennu's rugged surface, right? So here's a, so uh, these are just random, these are actually almost all on the web. If you go to the, uh, the team website, I'm using almost entirely public release pictures just because it's a whole lot easier to get permission to do so. So, <coughs> so here's a, an area, basically it's just a pile of boulders. Um, this is not where we're planning, planning to go, try to get our sample. Um, but you can just see that, there, and I, I, the scale of this, yeah, these are probably a, a couple, like, 
boulders. These are pretty big rocks. Uh, this again is that great biggest one, and uh, I actually uh, this is the, the the one we saw in the radar image, and the, one of the neat things about this is it looks like it's just perched on the surface, right? Well, we we th we think Bennu is a, basically a rubble pile. It's just a pile of rocks and gravel that sort of smudged down into a sphere from gravity, but yet it looks like somebody went and sort of dropped that one big rock on top. So maybe what happened is it got uh, when it formed a larger asteroid got smashed up. And that was just sort of the last one to kind of gently fall down to the surface and be on top there. So, <coughs> again, a bunch of just big boulders. Uh, uh, some of them are oddly shaped. This one sort of is dark, but it has some lighter things on it. Here, uh, we, we have, there's a whole bunch of these. They, we, we call them campfires. Um, where there's a, a sort of a ring of boulders here. What we think happened here is that there was a, a bigger rock and that over time as the sun rises and sets and rises and sets, heats it up, cools off, heats up, cools off, that, it, that the rock is cracking and just sort of falling into pieces. And so as that happens, you end up with these, just a, 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 a sort of a circular pile of rocks as it, as it fell down. There's a few of these and uh, uh, and maybe the reason that, that, the, that they are the way they are, that, that they're this size is the original rock might have sort of been what we call a breccia, which is a, sort of a clump of a bunch of different rocks sort of that had got glued together when the asteroid was formed. And when it breaks, they kind of fall into big pieces but, um, that stay together. We did not expect that. There's a bunch of different like so here is a much more angle. This is not right round, of course. So scale bar 20 meters. This is a pretty big rock. And you can see it's got a bunch of little lighter fragments in it. So remember, most of these rocks are as dark as charcoal. But with this one has a few brighter spots in it. This is probably actually from when the original asteroid formed or was sort of smashed the first time. Uh, little pieces. <laughs> Uh, ended up s smashed into it, and as, it, as these rocks get broken up, they're being exposed so that we can see them. There's a lot of these. Here's an interesting place, we, we call this Boulder Town. It's an unofficial name that no one's ever supposed to use, but that's what we call it. So you can see there's a whole bunch of rocks, and it looks like, if you look in here, it looks like sort of it, uh, rocks are falling into a pit uh, f down a slope. We don't know where that pit would come from. It doesn't look like a crater. It, uh, but uh, somehow when the, when, when the asteroid formed, it, that ended up as a low spot. And so these rocks look like they're kind of falling into it. Um, hmm. We got one, so, th this is a, so this is, looks like a crater, and it's 130 meters in diameter. That's pretty much big enough. So uh, this, it's, we think it's an impact crater, right? So something, some large rock came in, hit this, and made that big hole. Anything that made that big a hole probably seems like it should have just blown Bennu to pieces. It's pretty close to how big you need to be to do that, and it didn't. So Bennu is very surprising in that it seems to have these features, which there aren't that many big rocks around, so this is probably a very old feet, a very old crater. It, they, they don't happen very often, so we figure it probably happened a long time ago. And also the, the, edges are, the, the edges of this crater aren't really very sharp. It's very soft, so it looks like it's been beat up for a while. So this looks like a very old crater. But other things on the surface look very young. So we're trying to figure out how long has Bennu been like this. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, so it probably came from the asteroid belt maybe 10-ish million years ago. It hasn't been near Earth very long. Things don't last too long near the Earth. Yet this crater looks like it's maybe 100 times older than that. So we're trying to figure out the chronology of Bennu. How did all the different pieces get to be where they are? And, um, <coughs> and why is it that some things look old and some things look young? And I think right now what we're thinking is and things that are impact generated, things like this crater, anything that affects the, gr the overall structure is probably something that's pretty old. But that there's a lot of smaller scale stuff, again, probably from the sunlight hitting it and cracking things. And maybe also the sunlight turns out is, is causing Bennu to, to spin faster with time, is doing smaller scale um, changes to Bennu. 
there's a, so there's a bunch of other little craters. Uh, this one here in the middle there's, is blown up, is one of the freshest looking craters. It looks like it's not as nearly as old as the others. <coughs> Where, and, uh, so there's, there's a, when we first arrived, I predicted there would be no craters on Bennu, that the surface of Bennu would be too young to have craters. Well, I was wrong. It has craters. Now, of course, as, so if you saw that sampler head in the, in the beginning, we said this is how Osiris Rex is going to pick up uh, material. It's about this big, and what it does is it blows nitrogen through a filter. So we need, and, it, and the example we had was sand. It doesn't have to be sand. We've tested it with gravel, and it works fine. But we do need small kinds of particles. So we're looking and looking at all these great big rocks and saying, uh, now what? We do see regions. So this is, this is five meters across that has a lot of, it's a crater with a bunch of dirt at the bottom. That's where we want to go, is craters with dirt at the bottom. Now, this particular one has the problem, this is great big rock. And so we don't want to go crash into the great big rock. So we're not going to this one. Um, at least probably not. It's way down in the list. <coughs> it was one of our favorite sites looking at the bottom, but, it, it, but this rock is not our favorite rock. So, but there are places on Bennu that do have the, 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 the sample head should be very good at picking up, so we're optimistic that we're going to find what we need to find and uh, be able to bring our sample back, which is going to be, which is going to be amazing. All right, so this is just again more cool pictures to look at of Bennu because Bennu is nuts. So this image is, as it says, this is about 100 meters across. And uh, this is what it's, we call it, it, it's called a high phase image. The sun is coming from the far left. So you see the, all the shadows are very, these are the same image just with different sort of contrast settings. And so you see the shadows are long, but so the, the, this lighting really makes you able to see topography. You, you can see what's sticking up. It's, you can't really look at the, um, the color very well or anything like that, but you can see the topography. All right, and now we're gonna zoom in on this square. So zooming in on this square, what you see is a lot of sort of kind of beat up rocks at this scale. And this looks like kind of a small crater there and a bunch of little, and, but the, the, this particular spot has a bunch of just very rough looking rocks. And we're gonna blow up that square again. And here you can see, right, it's got this pit which almost, look, <coughs> these rocks look kind of, a bunch of different rocks, right, a few centimeters in size. They all look kind of the same. Got this pit that where maybe there was a, like a micrometeorite came in and tore out a piece of it. So just cool stuff on it. Other rocks, right, so those rocks look, th these rocks look real rough. We have other rocks that look very smooth. They, uh, we, we don't know if they're the same. <coughs> It, maybe if you broke one of these open, it would look like that. And in fact, there is one which I meant to go get, but I, I couldn't find it. That half the rock looks like it has a very smooth texture, and then it looked like somebody sort of opened it up and let the gravel out. It looks like, uh, it, so the same rock is sort of rough inside and smooth on the surface. Uh, we're trying to figure out what that means. And again, right, so here you can see this, this kind of looks almost like, so it look, kind of looks like a piece of like, uh, church or something, a piece of, of like something you would make arrowheads out of or, or lava rocks or something. Something very, very hard and, and that breaks cleanly next to a bunch of other just real rough things. Oh, and, and it also, right, so, and it has smooth surfaces, flat surfaces. So something has chipped away at this to make it flat, probably crashing into some other rock. Um, and it has this pit taken out of it, which kind of, look, again, might, might be an impact crater. Very small. This is uh, 2.5 centimeters of pixel. So these are like this big. <coughs> and then we have just a bunch of, a, a few, not very many, rocks that, and we're having a big discussion about, about this one, as to whether this is a rock that has a bunch of different colors, or if some white rocks fell on a big dark rock. And with, at this, the, the, uh, you can see the pixels in here, and so this is the best we could do with this. 
we're, we're starting to get finer and finer and finer imagery, so we will get a better picture of this, at which point we'll be able to see, is it rocks on top of rocks, or is this a weird rock with white spots on it? Yeah, more rocks with white spots on them, or possibly rocks with other rocks sitting on top. Now, if you remember, we, we, have these, we have these particles that are being shot off. The particles are sort of centimeter size or a couple centimeters in size, and probably occasionally there are bigger ones. Those are the ones we've seen. So it's possible that those are sort of wandering off and crashing back down, and that's what's make, being these rocks on top of other rocks. It's possible. Uh, it doesn't, thinking about it, it doesn't seem like there's enough of them, but it's been out there for millions of years doing this. And so it's very hard in your head to say, if something happens once a week, how many times has it happened in a million years, right? Over the surface, that's a very hard problem to, to, to solve. More cool rocks. We spend a lot of time, actually, at Osiris Rex looking at pictures of cool rocks. Partially because one of the things we have to do is do things like count them, find out how many there are to be a hazard, and so you go and you kind of draw a little line on each one of the rocks because we need to know where they are and how many there are. Uh, for each one, you can say, ooh, ah. Here's an interesting one. It looks like there's a crack. This is sort of a flat face with a crack. And this is another one that we think is prob it's probably some sort of heating process. This actually happens on the Earth sometimes. <coughs> Excuse me. Where as things heat and cool and heat and cool, you'll get like flat faces sort of falling off. So you'll get a rock with a bunch of flat pieces next to it. And we've seen that on Venu. There's one place that kind of looks to me like icebergs have been calving off of a, off of a rock. And we, we think that's almost certainly what, what, how, what this is. It's, Thermal cycling, possibly with chemistry involved too, maybe uh, as, as you heat it, the, the, there's some water in some of these rocks and maybe it gets cooked out. The details are something we're really working on quite a bit. <coughs> I, I should have known this was coming. So this is, this is my one sort of spectroscopy slide. So one of the things, you, uh, anytime you send, uh, after you take a picture, you do what we call spectroscopy, you measure uh, how, how reflective the rocks are as a function of color, right? So th this, uh, so we have a plot of how reflective Bennu is as a function of color. And the red stuff is what we measure from the ground, but the atmosphere means you can't go any farther than that. This big dip right here, that's water, or, prob or really rusty rocks. So these are rusted rocks, um, which is, Interesting, it means, it, uh, one of the things it means is if you went there, you could probably actually get water out of it if you wanted to, um, which is important for space resources. If you ever want to go fly around the solar system, you need one of the, the probably the most important thing you could find out, uh, away from the Earth is water. What, there's lots of water on the Earth, but if you're on the moon or in the asteroids, water is, is your, the biggest resource you're looking for. And so even tiny bits of water to find out where, to find where you're, where you want it is a real big win. To some extent, out in space, so power is free, solar cells are free. They're expensive, but they're not as expensive as water. And so uh, that's one of the main things that, we, that, you, that you want to find for resources. And so this was something that we did. To, so this black line here is what we call the spectrum of Bennu. And here you can say Bennu is a close match to these different meteorites. And there's a whole bunch of different ones plotted. And if you look, you'll actually say, well, it's kind of like some of those, but it's not exactly like any of them. <coughs> and I think this is possibly going to be one of the most exciting things. So almost everything we know about what the Earth is made out of, or what the sun is made out of, isn't because we study the Earth and the sun. It's because we study meteorites, rocks that fall in the ground. We pick them up and, say, and, and we can measure them in great detail, their chemistry in great detail, and we say, we think this came from before the Earth was formed, and we, can, and we can measure it and figure out what is the Earth made out of, what is the solar system made out of. Well, Bennu doesn't seem to match any of the ones we can find. It's similar, but it's not the same. It's possible that Bennu represents something that we've never, that has never fallen to the Earth. So it's going to be a new type of meteorite that we've never seen before. And the reason for that would be that that kind of material, that kind of friable material that breaks into pieces and Probably when it falls into the earth, if it, when it hits the atmosphere, it breaks into pieces and burns up. It's quite possible that we have never seen 
a piece of Beno on our, uh, as a meteorite that was, uh, that we've been looking for for hundreds of years, 800 years, and uh, that's really cool. That we'll get a new piece of information about sort of the formation of the Earth, formation of the solar system, and say th that it'll really be a unique thing. We'll, we'll we'll have gotten our money's worth. One of the things I always say when people talk, ask about why are we doing this. Uh, when you propose a space mission, you have to say, we're going to go and we're going to study this and we're going to learn this. And um, in every case so far, we're wrong. We learn all kinds of stuff, but not that. And my feeling on that is, well, if you, if you went somewhere and it was exactly like you predicted, you were exactly right, you just wasted a lot of money. We've, it's never happened before. Clearly, it's not happening to us. We don't have this problem. We're not wasting our money. We're finding something totally new and different, completely unexpected. That's going to teach us a lot about <coughs> a lot about well, a lot about Bennu, and it'll also teach us a lot about sort of how the Earth was formed, how we got here, how the solar system was formed. <coughs> Excuse me. I always forget the slide. Those those are details. All right, a couple of rocks are really bright. Remember, I said that. Uh, uh, Venus is dark as charcoal. Well, this is kind of like a rock you would go find outside. This is it's several times brighter than the surrounding terrain. Yep. <coughs> we very much think that this almost certainly is from another asteroid, right? The asteroids cr crunch into each other all the time, so we think this is a piece of another asteroid that got blasted off and dropped on the surface of Bennu. And, uh, one of the neatest things about that actually is how does something, oops, <coughs> how does something so big land intact? And so that's one of the things we're studying. It's possible this happened before Bennu itself was formed. It may have happened. Bennu probably is a piece of a larger thing and it may have come from there. But we're pretty sure this is not from whatever made Bennu itself. It's, it's something else that fell onto it. <coughs> so hopefully that's not what we get the piece of. All right. So now, <coughs> I think I'm running out of steam here. Now, so the, uh, we have our global map of Beno. Right now, what we're doing right now this month is working on, so where are we going to go get our sample? We have this whole big asteroid. It doesn't have any great ponds of sand, which is kind of what we were hoping for. Where are we going to go? And at the moment, we've chosen four sites, Sand Viper, Osprey, Kingfisher, Nightingale. We gave them bird names. Bennu is... Um, the bird that sits on top of the pyramid in Egypt. It's, it's the phoenix, and so since it's a, uh, it was named in a competition, and <coughs> since, it's, since Bennu is a bird, we decided that we would name our target sites after birds. So here they are, um, you know, sort of medium close-up. One of them is the crater I showed you before. It's sort of a fairly fresh crater, has a fairly, fairly smooth bottom. We're actually thinking probably more on this side than we were on this side. Uh, um, the first one we looked at was what we call a sandpiper. It, its primary benefit is that it's flat and there's not, at least if you go up here, there's not a lot of big rocks to run into. There's kingfisher, which is really smooth in the bottom, but it's just that we think it's probably a little too small. So we're going to see if we can get the spacecraft in there, but we're just not sure. Nightingale, which is a fairly big space to go looking for sample, uh, but it turns out it's pretty far north and it may be kind of hard to get there. And then this one we call Osprey is, has several different places that we could consider going. <coughs> so right now, as I said, what we're doing is we're going and studying each of these sample sites. We've, uh, we took data on Sandpiper a week ago Saturday. We took data on Osprey last Saturday, Kingfisher's ne Fisher's Nest this coming Saturday, and then Nightingale's the Saturday after that. When we're measuring these, these uh, craters, we're doing things like looking at the slopes and the tilts, measuring uh, physical properties of them. So here is uh, the, the, for the, the spacecraft wants to be able to hit a fairly flat surface. So we measured, well, how flat is the surface? And uh, by looking at the topography, we can say, okay, there's a couple of different places that are green in here and in here that have the right kind of surface that we could actually go there. And so we're studying each of these sites in great detail to figure out where's the safest place to get, Where's there's the best sample, the, most li the highest likelihood that we're going to be able to get the sample back? We do get three tries. Uh, we have three bottles of nitrogen, so we get three tries if we have to. We don't want to have to use more than one try because 
we just don't. But hmm. so this was safety. This is sampleability. It's the sa this is the same crater. Looking at how much stuff there is that we could pick up. The best spots are over here, down at the bottom, and over there. We actually like this spot, except for that one rock right there. We really wish that rock, somebody go scoot that away, and then it'll be a great spot. People have talked about taking the, the sample head and kind of pushing on things with it. No. <coughs> okay, so here's the, uh, here's the Nightingale site. We have not done our high resolution on this site yet. It's up here in the north. And so at somewhat higher resolution, but again, this is not the final one. Uh, it still looks like there's some dirt. There's also some rocks. And there's kind of a few great big rocks which are giving us some concern. Kingfisher is, the, is much closer to the equator, so it's easier to get to. It's, again, it looks pretty smooth at this scale. It's just a little too small. There's a bunch of, there's a really nice patch in the middle, um, but then there's rocks on the other side. Sandpiper, again, we took data a week ago Saturday, and it was the one, uh, so here's the image about like what I was showing you before, and then here's one, I think it's, it's a, a centimeter and a half per pixel, so this is pretty high resolution. You can see that it's kind of flat in the back, but it also has a lot of sort of one meter-ish rocks, which we're not too thrilled about. We think we probably could get a sample, probably from in here. Uh, it's, I, I don't... Personally, I don't think this is the best site, but it's, it's definitely still possible. Um, then this, uh, uh, right here, oh, that, yeah. This is the, so I zoomed in on that. Again, you can see that there's some pretty good spots in here, but there's also just a lot of bigger rocks than we would like. This is Osprey. This is the one we took last Saturday. Please don't tweet this picture. It's going to be released tomorrow to the public. So hot off the press. Uh, uh, Wait till midnight. <laughs> so that's from uh, again near the equator, which is good because we can kind of get to it. Here's what the crater looks like. It's got this one rock at the top, but that's, that doesn't give us too much concern. Turns out that rock isn't all that high. It kind of grades down into the surface. But, uh, uh, and one of the questions we had, this thing in the middle, we weren't sure if it was sort of a boulder sticking out or a nice pile of dirt. Well, this is our high resolution data and it's looking pretty good. It's looking like it might be a nice pile of dirt. So we're kind of liking this one. Uh, some of the places we were hoping, uh, here, here's the rock with the, that I pointed out before. You can see it's a big shadow. We don't like that one too much. Originally we were looking over here because it looks very uniform. Well, it's uniformly rocky. So that's, <laughs> so that's not so good. But in here in the middle is, is so this is definitely on our list. Um, <coughs> Personally, I'm hoping for uh, Nightingale. I just think this is the sort of uh, smoothest area. All right, so, the, uh, the, so this is the shape model of Bennu that, that we have that um, actually I think, that, I'm not sure if it's this one. There's one of them that's actually in the web. You can go 3, 3D print your own. Um, and the different sites and where they are. This is where we are in the mission, right? So uh, end of last year, we arrived at Bennu. Those first, the, the global pictures that you could see were taken in what we call preliminary survey, where we sort of got our bearings, got into orbit. We went into orbit and used um, the laser ranger to take very high uh, detailed uh, laser ranging images. And that's what that mo shape model was made from. In detailed survey, we took all the spectroscopy me measurements, we took color photos, um, just a lot of different stuff. N right now what we're on is what we call recon, where we're going and looking at the four sites that we've chosen. In December, we're gonna narrow that down to a prime and a backup site and go and converse with NASA and say, this is what we wanna do. Uh, then in the spring, uh, it's been put off now till like February, we're gonna go, uh, Having chosen the prime site, we're going to go and basically practice going down, right? go halfway down, go two-thirds of the way down, make sure our procedures are right. So no one has ever orbited an object this small before. We're the first people to orbit anything this size. You may have heard of the Hayabusa 2 mission, which is at a, a more similar asteroid than we expected. But what they do is they stay really far away. They don't get 
they don't orbit it, and then they go in, grab their sample, and leave again. So th th they have a very different sort of mode of doing things. We're staying close. We're going to go and practice. So we go like, yeah, we, we go down 100 meters above the surface, back off, say, did that work? Yes. And then we're going to go down to 20 meters above the surface, and back off. And so during the spring, we're going to do all that practicing. And then uh, right now, we're, we're hoping to tag on July 4th. That'll be fun. Although it turns out there are three Mars missions launching this summer. And Mars missions need the Deep Space Network. Any, anybody launching needs the Deep Space Network. So we think we're going to have a very hard time getting uh, communications with the, with the spacecraft. When we're doing this, we're, we need 24-7 coverage, absolutely talking to the spacecraft all the time. And because all those Mars missions are launching, we may not be able to do it for another few weeks. Um, they, they, they have their turn too. It's, 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 it's great that we're launching all these missions to Mars. <coughs> You'd think we would have planned this ahead, but to some extent, missions get delayed, and so you can't think too far ahead about what's coming up you know, five years from now because things get rearranged. And so uh, we, may not, we may not be able to do it to August, but still, nominally, 4th of July, we're going to get our sample, and then uh, it, it actually doesn't arrive back to Earth until 2023. All right, and so we have our various logos. <coughs> and that's it for my presentation. I'll take any questions. Cool. Thank you, Mike. So time for a few questions. Start right here. So you said that the um, kind of when the particles were collected, you'd bring it back, and the plan was to land in the Utah desert. Is there any reason you chose that of all places? It turns out that there's a, there's a it's called the U Utah Test and Training Range, and so it is actually a big piece of dirt that's sort of for that. Uh, you need a big empty space because you, you co we're coming in at 12, how, how many thousand miles an hour, right? It's 12 kilometers a second. And so we can aim pretty well, but not real well. And so you need a big empty space. And so it's actually, it's a military uh, testing ground. And so there's nothing valuable to hit. There's nobody to hurt. Not much lives there. So that's the space that we've chosen. That everybody, and, uh, all, of the, all of the missions that have brought back this sort of hard lander kind of things, all the American ones anyway, have gone there. The Russian ones go to Kazakhstan. <laughs> And it, we don't want to land in the water because this is not, it's a small thing, it doesn't have parachutes, it's just, so there'd be no way to recover it. So it's not landing in the water like the astronauts, it's got to land on the ground so you can pick it up. And so that's the place. Other questions? Okay, here and then. Um, I think I missed it. Um, what was the reason why you like, need the smaller particles as your sample as opposed to like a I did I didn't show a diagram of the sampler head but basically uh, it has a an, a an opening that's kind of big but in order to get the dirt to go in and not come back out again there's kind of a flap and the space is about two centimeters across and so that's just what ours can do we're, and we're blowing material in and so it's got to be pretty movable it's not like we have a claw and we're grabbing in which case we would want something a little bigger so it's just because we're, the way we're ingesting it is blowing stuff into a, into a container, and that turns out to be the right size. These objects that are ejected from the surface that you said weren't a threat, how fast are they moving? Uh, walking speed, a meter a second. You, uh, if you were on Venu and jumped, you would leave. Okay. Other questions? There's gravity, but not much. Okay. Here, and then you got one back there. Did you uh, say that <clears throat> the uh, return pod will be coming in on parachute? Not, no, not on a parachute. Oh, not on a parachute. Hard lender. Wow. Okay, so it's going to be moving pretty quick, and it'll be able to withstand the yes. hard impact. Uh, yeah, it, it, it'll, it, it's moving pretty quick, and it will be able to withstand impact. It slows down in the atmosphere, right? As it hits the atmosphere, it's got that sort of con a conical reentry capsule shape. And so it'll be moving a few hundred, um, like 100 miles an hour or something like that when it finally hits. But it's going to be just straight in. I've got two questions, if you don't mind. 
Uh, first, does the spacecraft have any kind of self-contained collision avoidance capability? You know, uh, in the sense of at Bennu or on Earth? When it's, in, when it's close to the So it has a lot, of, yeah, it sort of does. So what it has, um, a, as it's going in, it's taking pictures about every 10 seconds. And it has a map of where it's trying to go. And it's following, it's, it's following itself along on the map and making sure that it's on track. And then it, if it, it discovers that it's not in the right place, it bails out. I see. Good. Thank you. The other question was, uh, are there any 3D images, close, like high-res 3D images of the surface? You talked about a 3D imaging of the, of the entire there are some. There, there are some. If you want to look for 3D images, actually go to the website, because those are really cool, so we always put them there. So uh, if, you go to, if you go to the Asteroid Mission website, it's there, asteroidmission.org. There's a bunch, so there's a lot of anaglyphs, and right where you need the red green glasses. And there's also some where you do either, uh, where you can look at them kind of cross-eyed. Um, and the other place, do you know where the Brian May one? What? Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. So Brian May um, makes these makes these um, uh, 3D that you, uh, images that you use with the viewer, and uh, I guess they're on Instagram. Thank you. Other questions? In one of the images you presented, you said there was a pit on the surface. Do you have any theories of how it formed? So the pits, we think, of that size. So that pit was about this big, I think. We think that's basically a, a micrometeorite. So a piece of another asteroid or a comet or something like that coming in fast, right? So like five kilometers a second is typical. And so something, a, a fast rock, maybe BB-sized, would make a hole of about the right size. And that happens. At, so, and we, we know they're there. They hit the Earth. We can see them hitting the moon, too. So we, we know about how fast that should they, <coughs> In fact, that's how we actually figure out how old these surfaces are, is to see how many pits there are on them. Hmm. Is there, did you, any other questions? Nope. All right, then let's thank Dr. Nolan again.